can start recording. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's like church. We need to record the pledge. Yes. It's very important. Okay. Hello, and welcome to the December 6th special meeting of the school committee. I would ask you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we are going to interview two candidates for the position of superintendent of schools um, tonight. We will interview Greg Martineau first, and then at 7 o'clock we will interview Peter Light. So I think Mr. Martineau is ready to join us. So we will invite him in. Yep, here he is. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming you. back. Very nice Thank to you. see you. Nice to see you. Hi. Good nice evening. to see you. Nice to see you again. Have a seat. Have you met everybody? I think I have. Okay. So. Very good. Very good. Um, well, welcome. So um, we have about 50 minutes, and we're going to ask you about 10 questions. So I know you can allocate your time appropriately, and there's a clock over there which seems to be working. So we'll use that um, as our guide. And I will just kick things off by um, asking you to tell us a little bit about why Hopkinton, why now? So. Um I've given that question a lot of thought myself. Um, thinking about the type of community that I would like to be a part of and, and lead as a superintendent, um, I think of communities that value education, that are committed to education, that have a strong you know, form of government that supports schools, supports public safety in, in the towns. Um, you know, community population that supports education and values education. Um, I think of a community um, where it supports its educators and gives them the resources and tools to do a job well and hires leaders um, who are visionary, think outside the box, and um, are exceptional at their craft. And I think of students, um, you know, the type of student that the community is trying to develop and promote and, and grow. Um, and when I think of all the, the qualities of the community that I'd, I'd be honored to lead and, and serve, Hopkinton fits all of those um, criteria for me. Um, it's a community I know. Um, obviously, I've worked in the community, and I know um, the type of commitment the community has to education. I know the quality of the leadership team and the school committee and the dedication the school committee has toward education. Um, I know how hard teachers work on behalf of students, and I think um, most importantly, this, the students are outstanding and are amazing. And um, you know, it, it, it would be an honor to um, lead lead the work here. Um, when thinking about my career trajectory, this is a goal that I've had. I've always wanted to be a superintendent. Um, since I was a kid, which is kind of a, a, an odd endeavor. Um, I grew up in a family where education was valued. My great-grandparents, my grandmother, my, my mom, all were educators. And I think when you grow up in that environment, you, I, I think, learn quickly that it's, it's a noble and important profession. Um, so I had an opportunity to think about when I wanted to be a superintendent and what types of experiences I, I needed to, to do the job well. And I've really um, organized my career around that. Um, so I've ha had a continuum of experiences in the school setting, from classroom teacher to specialist to technology director to principal to uh, most recently as an assistant superintendent. Um, my intention was not to become a superintendent over the next year or two. Um, my intention was to compete for the position in Northborough and Southborough when the superintendent retires. I, I am very fortunate to work in a, an amazing place with great people. But when I saw that um, Dr. McLeod was retiring um, and I saw the opportunity, I thought long and hard about um, sometimes opportunities present themselves and they're not always, they don't always fit in your timeline and um, so I made a decision to apply. and. Um, hopefully compete for the position. Um, so 
that's where I am today, and that's why I'd love to um, be the next superintendent of Hopkinton Public Schools. Thank you. So as you know, Hopkinton is a town and a, a district that uh, we're invested in our schools, and we take pride in the accomplishments that we have made this far. But we're looking kind of where we're going from here and, and would like to hear a little bit about what your vision would be for the district going forward. Well, I think um, when you look at the, the community's master plan and they talk about sustaining ac excellence, um, I think uh, first and foremost that's essential. I think we're thinking about how we can sustain the high quality um, education that students experience um, currently today. I think that um, when we think about um, the world that we live in, um, you know, I think the changing geopolitical landscape that exists, um, I think that, that it's even more important that we are preparing students to enter the, the world of work and career and are able to be citizens and, and participate in the, um, the democratic process. I think it's essential that we um, look at creating students who can think critically, who can collaborate, who are creative and who communicate well. Um, and I think thinking about what types of experiences do we need to provide students so they can develop those skills. I think if we think about you know the current uh, kindergarten class, the world that they'll enter in terms of career and work is going to be uh, very different than we probably can imagine in picture. Um, but what will endure are those in you know, the four C's. Um, I think um, the critical thinking skills um, are essential. I think um, students are going to enter uh, the world of work and the world of community, and there are going to be some big challenges and big problems that are going to uh, need to be solved, and we need to ensure that our kids are ready for those. So, um, you know, thinking about um, how can we prepare students to work in that type of environment and develop those skills? So thinking about um, how can we use technology to expand the offerings that students have, how to participate in a more of a, a global, um, more global experiences beyond the four walls of the classroom and the, the boundaries of the school, and ensuring that kids have opportunities to engage in um, authentic learning experiences that allow them to become problem solvers and critical thinkers um, as they move to, to their next journey, whether that's college or career. Thank you. So one of the important roles of the superintendent is obviously building the annual budget for the school district. Um, our budget typically represents around 52% of the overall town budget. Um, given the constraints of municipal budgeting, how would you collaborate with town hall and other departments and boards to ensure that we draft a responsible budget, but that the school's interests are advanced? Well, I think um, for me, the budget, the budget is a vehicle to accomplish goals. So I think it, it's essential that the um, strategic plan and the goals that the school district is trying to accomplish um, is clearly defined, well articulated that there are benchmarks, there are strategic goals and outcomes. Um, and I think that that's essential uh, to drive the budget process because there are con financial constraints that, that all towns face. Um, I think the school um, department is one department of many in a larger ecosystem of a community. Um, and depending on the town context, there are different priorities, different initiatives um, that are competing for uh, a limited number of resources. You know, you have public safety, you have the maintenance of uh, facilities in towns, and I think it's essential that um, we work collaboratively with the town selectmen, uh, the finance committee, and the community to understand what those priorities are and, and what those limitations, what those constraints are. Um, and then making sure that a, a fiscally sound and educationally sound budget is, is developed and presented that is aligned to strategic goals that we're trying to accomplish. Um, I think it's um, an open and honest dialogue. It's being a participant in the process. It's understanding the town context. It's building relationships with um, the town government. It's um, working collaboratively with uh, the community to really understand what those priorities are. Um, and then working with the town manager 
and understanding what the box is, what the framework is, and seeing if we can accomplish those goals with, within that framework. Um, I th it's not always about money. I think if we focus on what types of outcomes are we trying to achieve, what types of resources do we need to accomplish those, many times we can reallocate resources and shift resources to accomplish the goals. However, when we can't and we need to make difficult decisions, we need to make sure that the story behind why the, decision, the difficult decision is made is educationally sound, is centered around students and the student experience, and that there's a rationale behind it. Um, in the towns of North Pro and South Pro in Algonquin, um, there are three budgets, um, and we work very collaboratively with the town administrators in both uh, North Pro and South Pro. Um, we work very closely with the select um, board. Uh, we work very closely with the school committee to live within those um, fiscal um, limitations that sometimes exist. And we are always a team player in terms of understanding the larger context. And for example, in the town of Southboro right now, they are um, building a municipal safety building. Um, and we had some capital projects that were in um, on our capital plan. And because of the context of the municipal safety building being um, a project being brought forward, um, we're pushing out the capital plan for, for a year um, to give some some flexibility in terms of, of what's happening in the town context. So it's building relationships, it's having conversations, it's having a strategic plan, and then when, um, and it's having an educationally sound and fiscally responsible budget. And when we can't come in within the constraints, that the, re the reasons and the rationale are very clear, very student-centered, are very focused, and the story is clear on why that is. Um, can you tell us what you think the greatest challenge your district has faced or is facing in the area of special education? And how have you worked with your current team to make improvements with it? And how do you envision the role of the superintendent in addressing these challenges? So I think the, um, one, of the, one of the challenges that we're facing is the, is the social emotional um, learning and the, the social and emotional um, how kids are presenting when they arrive to school we're seeing an increase in terms of um, anxiety high levels of stress um, and really th as a community really thinking about you know why why is that how can we support students who are feeling anxious how can we support uh, students who are feeling stressed and overtaxed um, so we've had as a leadership team and a community, a lot of conversations around, you know, what is the root cause? Why is this happening? And what types of supports and safety nets do students require in order for students to be successful in, in the school environment and the community environment? Um, so we have, um, even though we are three separate um, entities, we are considered NASA, which is Northboro Algonquin Southboro Administrators, which is a team of 29. And we collectively problem solve, because this is not unique to any one organization um, in Northboro, Southboro. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about looking at Metro West adolescent health data, talking with kids, um, thinking about what types of learning experiences are kids um, having around developing their own social and emotional learning. How are they developing their resiliency skills and persistence skills? And how are we uh, fostering independence and in supporting students who are maybe struggling with anxiety or, or stress? Um, we've actually added uh, a number of um, positions to support students. Um, we've added um, adjustment counselors, um, and we've added additional um, school psychologists. So every elementary building in our district has a, um, a school adjustment counselor and a, and a school, school psychologist, who, and they take a very proactive approach in leading the work um, in the building around social and emotional learning. We also talk about um, if we have, you know, so students are presenting uh, with, with anxiety, um, with high levels of stress. Um, we also talk about the importance of creating a classroom environment that is engaging, 
that is exciting, where students are um, experiencing authentic learning experiences, engaged in the real real work of science, the real work of writing. Um, and we also um, do a lot of work talking about how can we make sure that every student has a strong connection to an adult in the community, whether it's the classroom teacher, a coach, um, that that's essential. And we spend a lot of time talking about how we can ensure that that happens. Um, so w this has been a multi-year journey for us. I don't think it, um, we haven't found the perfect solution, but we've really talked about how can we support the students and how can we support it educators um, in terms of how they can support the work that's happening in their classrooms when students present with anxiety what are some strategies you know what types of classroom climates and environments are necessary to establish so that their teachers are prepared to um, ensure that students have what they need and we've also done a lot of work with the community um, we have this is our fourth year conducting speaker series we have four um, speakers uh, speak uh, to the community and provide educational topics to the community. And um, a, a majority of those have been around um, the challenges of parenting, um, how we can, as parents in the community, um, help students develop those you know, strategies to persist and be resilient and face adversity. Um, you know, most recently we we had uh, Jessica Minahan, who's the author of Behavior Code, come and, and speak to the community, and she also um, has worked with our faculty and staff on a, a consultation basis. Um, so, we're, as a team, we've really set up a plan to work with teachers, um, students, making sure that we have the financial uh, backing to support what we need in our classrooms and also making sure that it's a community conversation, not just a school conversation. Can I ask a follow-up question? So, um, and maybe connecting the last two questions, you, you mentioned the additional positions, specifically the adjustment counselors. So as you think about those, um, how are you measuring the success and effectiveness of those roles? So, I, um, great question. I think it's a very difficult um, area to quantify in terms of, you know, you implemented X, the outcome was Y in terms of quantity, uh, quantifying it. Um, we are looking at um, having some surveys, um, periodic surveys, and benchmarking. Um, we use the Metro West Adolescent Health Survey as one of our benchmarks, but doing some internal surveys around, and we're working with a company called Panorama, um, and they have some, um, a, a number of social emotional surveys the students take, that teachers take, and the community takes, that allows you to benchmark where, where you are as a community, um, and then you repeat those over a period of, of years. So you actually then have some longitudinal data to see if those are actually having an impact. Um, we're also looking at the number of, um, you know, the number of referrals to the office. We're also looking at some of the data that we have internally. We're looking at anecdotal data and having conversations with teachers around how do they feel supported in terms of their work um, when they have a student who um, who needs additional support? Are they feeling like they have the tools and resources to make sure the student has what, what he or she needs? So um, I think it's hard to quantify, but you know we, we're looking at benchmarking and looking at um, identifying what the outcomes we're hoping to achieve and then, and then measuring it based on that. Great. Thank you. Good. Hi, Greg. Hello. So um, our community is in a period of sustained growth and very shifting demographics. So what do you see as um, the challenging aspects of an increasingly diverse community? And sort of the second part of that is what kind of leadership efforts do you think are needed to encourage a commitment to excellence through, through diversity? So first, I think it's a, a great opportunity. Um, I think that as our communities um, in, in not just Hopkinton, but uh, I'll speak to North Brown South, but we are seeing um, great diversity, um, which is, which is um, really something we're celebrating. Um, we are linguistically diverse and culturally diverse, um, and we really celebrate that. Um, and I, you know, I, I know Hopkinton celebrates that as well. Um, I think that um, 
as we think about the type of st student we want leaving um, our educational system, I think it's essential that our students are prepared to to lead and work and uh, be a, a member of a community that is lingu linguistically diverse and culturally diverse. I think we want students to um, have a deep understanding for, for other cultures um, and develop empathy um, and develop understanding because the world of work that, that students are going to be entering is going to be um, far diverse and, and um, linguistically and, and culturally and diverse in, in ideas and thought um, than Hopkinton community. Um, so I think that what types of things do we need to do as an educational system to a promote and celebrate diversity, but also to ra to raise an understanding of of our own um, cultural proficiency as an organization, as a leadership team, and as educators. We've um, in North Brown South where we've done a lot of work with Assabet Valley Collaborative, working with consultants that they brought in around. Um, establishing and developing a deep understanding of um, what it means to be cultural, culturally proficient, um, learning about um, other cultures and, and learning about um, the world around us. And we've also done a lot of work of understanding our own implicit biases that we bring to the table that we might not understand. So we've looked at um, the Harvard um, implicit project around understanding you know, our own biases we bring to the work and really trying to um, deepen our understanding. Um, we sent a team to, um, to a training. Um, it was, uh, I think, over, over the course of the year, it was an, uh, an eight-day training. Um, that team has come back to our larger leadership team and done the train the trainer. Um, so at every meeting that we have uh, with the North Pro South Pro team, a part of that meeting is around understanding, uh, raising our cultural awareness, um, understanding differences, um, and we really, that leadership team, that cohort that is leading the work has been outstanding in, in doing that. And then principals have taken that back and, and they're using that work um, in, in conversations with faculties. Um, and lastly, you know, I think students, um, you know, really thinking about um, what types of experiences do students um, need to have to have, have a better understanding of who they are, the world they live in, um, understanding that other people's stories, develop, developing that sense of respect and that sense of empathy and understanding that is essential for um, students to um, leave our school system prepared for the world of work and, and citizenship and college and career. Thank you. Um, so, being a superintendent in Hopkinton requires you to be both an educational leader and a community leader. So for each role, what would you say are your greatest assets and what are areas of growth for you? So I'll start with areas for growth. Um, this, I've never been a superintendent, um, I have been around the the work of education for a number of years, um, but but being the superintendent is different than being the assistant superintendent. Um, I think a lot about um, the, the gravity of the work, the importance of the work, the seriousness of the work, um, and whatever position I've had, um, I'm better at. I'm better at that position after a year, after two years, after three years. So an area for growth would just be to sit in, in the chair and to work at becoming the best superintendent I possibly can, um, to hone my skills, um, to develop an, a deeper understanding of the work. Um, I often ask assistant superintendents who, um, who make that make that change from assistant superintendent to superintendent and all of the super assistant superintendents I talk to speak about underestimating the work um, and the challenge of the work. Um, so I think an area for growth for me would be um, 
entering the position and gaining experience around around working with town government managing the tension that can exist between making difficult decisions doing what's right for kids holding that fiscal that line um, and balancing all those pieces together um, so gaining experience in, in the role is something an, definitely an area of growth for me in terms of my strengths um, I think I'm a strong communicator a strong collaborator um, I listen um, I'm analytical um, before I make a decision I, I collect a lot of data a lot of input and a lot of feedback I'm very clear about when I make a decision whether I'm asking folks opinion in an advisory advisory role or if they are helping me make a decision um, and I'm very clear about that so um, you know listening listening communicating collaborating um, I think a strength of mine is setting goals I, I'm a very goal oriented person um, I need to work from st strategic plans and projections um, that drives the work um, and then I for me the most important um, a strength of mine is you know I, I understand that uh, the importance of this role and I approach my work and everyone I speak with with great respect um, and I might disagree with someone about a strategy or an idea but I'm always respectful and I always listen so I always bring um, perspective to the work that I do um, you know hard on ideas is easy on people um, we might disagree but at the end of the day when we walk away from the table I, I always will listen and be respectful of the people that I work with if I may ask a follow-up question to that to your comment just now hard on ideas and easy on people can you give an example of uh, when you had to use that yeah I mean I think we use it every day <laughs> um, in my current role as assist assistant superintendent um, you know so when you know we're talking about um, when we're talking about making a change um, you know one of the things we're talking about right now is uh, in North Borough and South Borough is um, school start time so um, you know the idea and the premise and the science behind it is very compelling around why at the high school middle school level we want to start at a later time um, but we need to dig deeply into the fiscal reality of making that happen um, we need to ask a lot of questions around you know is that fiscally responsible um, can we navigate North Pro, South Pro, and Algonquin communities in order to make that work? Um, you know, what is, you know, what is the, um, when we make a change at the high school level, middle school level, we, because we tier, we have four tiers of busing and buses tier off, what impact would that have in terms of a preschool or a kindergarten or a first grader who might be waiting at, 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 uh, or dropped off at a bus stop at a later time? Um, so it's really thinking about, um, you know, there's no argument around the science, it's compelling, but we need to ask critical ideas around can we make this work and, and make it safe for all students? And what are, what are the financial implications um, to the community in terms of making that work? Um, we have a, very, a strong parent advocate group who, um, they've done amazing work and really are advocates of um, starting later at the high school level and our job is is to work collaboratively and ask um, strategic and difficult questions around around how we can make it work how we can problem solve I'm confident that there's a solution mm -hmm. I, I know there's a solution that we can come up with um, but the solution might not be in the same time frame that maybe a parent organization would like or uh, a school committee member would like so it's, it's how can we solve the problem with with the constraints that we have um, working in a timeline that we can do it well thoughtfully and thoroughly so thank you so can you share with us please two risks that you took as an educational leader uh, one that worked out well and then one that worked out not so well and then what did you learn from it and how can you apply that uh, to learning in the future 
So in terms of um, my own professional professional growth, you know, whenever I um, make a decision to try a new um, position, um, you know, when I was a techno technology director in Hockington, I had an opportunity to be, become a building principal. Um, for me, that was a risk. I, I was in a place that I that I liked, that it was educationally stimulating, and um, really enjoyed the people I worked with. Um, for me, it was a risk um, because it made me, it, I was uncomfortable. I was doing something that I had not done before. I had always been part of schools. Um, I always was confident in my my um, skills. I always knew what my weaknesses were, but I was taking a risk going to a, a community and, and taking on a leadership role um, without a lot of experience in that position. Um, I've, I was uncomfortable. I've learned and I grew in the role. Um, I, I had the opportunity to work with uh, wonderful people, very talented people. Um, and, you know, for me, what I learned was that being a building principal is far more complex than I ever gave it credit. Um, that balancing community, families, teachers, students um, was, was great work, but hard work. Um, that um, as a building leader, you deal with some very difficult, emotional, um, complex topics whether it's the health of a staff member who was diagnosed with cancer and is, has terminal cancer, or a student who is struggling with um, some challenges, or a family struggling with some challenges. Um, these are um, very serious, very personal um, experiences. And I, I learned by, through experience that um, it's a great position, but it's a, it's a very challenging, challenging role, an important role and strong leadership is essential at the building level. And when you don't have that, it, it impacts the whole entire organization. The second, the second risk um, is, um, I think, making educators a, a little uncomfortable. Pushing, pushing the boundaries of, of um, an initiative where you know that um, teachers are feeling a little bit uncomfortable with that decision. And as, as a building leader, you always have, uh, there's, a, there's a healthy tension that exists between pushing an organization forward, listening to the, the members of that organization, and knowing that at a time, um, it, you need to push and you need to create a little more tension. And, and when I say tension, I don't mean that in a negative way. It's, it's I think as part of change, you need some of that, that tension uh, to exist. So when we've, um, you know, curriculum adoption can be, um, create some uncomfortable um, tension with teachers and make them feel a little uncomfortable because of the curriculum that they know and that they're teaching that they may have been teaching for a number of years is very comfortable to them. Um, but at times, the curriculum might not be aligned to student outcomes, the type of learner we're trying to foster and grow. And that, um, you know, so I've implemented uh, curriculum changes that, that have pushed people beyond um, what they typically might be comfortable with. What I've learned from those experiences is that it, this is a people business. That as a leader, you, you don't have a lot of power. You have positional power. Um, but, as, but the power base really is working collaboratively together. And that when you make a decision and you make a decision to move, the process needs to be thoroughly vetted. It needs to be thorough and thoughtful. So all stakeholders need to be at the table. Um, and it's better to move slowly than quickly. Um, and it, when, when you have the time. Um, and I also, um, you know, through that, through, so a mistake I made, I made, I moved too quickly. And um, I had enough trust in the organization that um, when this particular curriculum implementation, um, we were able to work through it and, and make it work for students. But 
what, one thing I would have done differently is I would have moved more slowly and more thoughtfully um, in the implementa implementation of, of that particular curriculum. Um, actually, probably working off that example, um, I'm interested in a, in a fairly recent scenario in your district where you've had to bring together a lot of different stakeholders from the, your administrative team, the community, um, any others, um, how you approached it, how things turned out, and how you controlled communication and messaging. So, um, so we've actually in, in North Bro and South Bro have had a lot of um, attrition through retirements. We've had um, one of the one of the biggest threats to the, the towns of North Bro and South Bro is they have a lot of talented people who are, who are at the age where they can retire. <laughs> Um, so, um, whenever there is a change of leadership, um, it is a big, it, it, it's a big focus and big priority for the community and the organization in terms of making sure that we hire the best um, leaders possible and, and that we have strong leaders in our buildings. Um, so, most recently, you know, I had the opportunity to chair the. Um, hiring committee um, for the high school principal. So we, ha um, we did not use NASDAQ or an outside organization to um, conduct that search. Um, so I worked very, so the superintendent asked if I would lead, lead the process and I worked very collaboratively with the um, uh, HR director. We had a um, 17 member committee um, with a diverse um, diverse representation in our community from select the select board from town government from educators um, not just in at Algonquin but from Northboro and Southboro um, parents um, parent teacher or organizations um, different education foundations um, we had folks sitting in um, from the Chamber of Commerce so it's a very collaborative process. As a committee, we spent a lot of time talking about the qualities and attributes we wanted in the next leader of um, Algonquin Regional High School. Um, we spent six or seven meetings just talking about those qualities and attributes and coming up with lists and thinking about the qualities that makes a great leader. Um, and from there, um, we developed I think a very impressive list. Probably no one can live up to all the, the traits and qualities that were expected. Um, but again, it was that conversation and that dialogue that that, that committee um, created. That committee also worked to develop um, interview questions. Um, you know, we, they did a great job in creating some, some great questions and making sure that they get to the information that they need. That, that I led, helped lead that committee to conduct community forums. So we had a number of community forums around. I'm sorry, does anyone have a tissue? Oh, oh I'm sure we I'll, I'll get a box. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I'd pack some, but I, oh, I didn't know. No, no, we've so got some. Right there's there. a box right over there. Jean's got it right over there. I'll pause until. <laughs> <laughs> So we held, we held a number of community forums, giving um, parents and the community members opportunities to engage in you know, what attributes and characteristics do, do they want to see in the next leader um, of Algonquin Regional High School. Um, we met with faculty and staff, and we had those conversations. Um, so at the time, we also had an internal candidate, um, which um, I was ch can change the dynamic. So we were also, as a committee, very sensitive in terms of, you know, we had an internal candidate who was um, putting him or herself out there to compete for this position, knowing very well that when you're an internal candidate, that's not an easy, not an easy ask. And not, so it, the committee did a great job being very sensitive about that. Um, so we had to navigate um, those waters around an internal cam candidate the high school faculty and staff trying, you know, there were some people who were sh strong supporters of that person. And um, my job was to lead the process 
and to make sure that the process was sound and true um, and under make people understand what that process was and why it was in place. Um, so the committee um, screened inter candidates, interviewed candidates, and ultimately made um, recommendations to um, send candidates on to the superintendent who um, then conducted the, the next level of, of uh, the search process. Um, but my role was really around engaging the community in a thorough vetting process that focused not just on hiring the next person, but making sure that it was clear around what attributes and what criteria we were looking for and what Algonquin and Regional High School needed at, at this particular um, time um, moving forward and making sure that <laughs> all of the stakeholders had an opportunity to have opportunities to engage in the dialogue, ask questions, and be part of the process. Um, so that's, that's one example of, of many where um, we don't make decisions in isolation, or I don't. Um, I, make, you know, I, I believe in the distributed leadership model. I believe that um, there are a lot of talented, intelligent people that I work with. Um, and when we make decisions, we make decisions in a collaborative manner. Um, but sometimes the superintendent and I are, are the folks who have to make the final decision. After we've received all the feedback and input, sometimes the decision we make um, might, is, is the difficult decision because that's our job and our responsibility. Great. Um, what do you see is the role of the superintendent in the classroom? And how do you identify and measure excellent teaching and learning? So um, I, uh, I began my career as an educator, and I'm still an educator. Um, I love to learn myself. I'm always learning. I'm always uh, reading and listening to podcasts and learning from my colleagues and attending conferences. Um, I see my primary function as a superintendent as being the instructional leader. Um, getting people around the table to talk about what does good teaching look like. When we walk into a classroom, um, what, what are we hoping to see? Um, what are the students, what are the students engaged in, in terms of task? So really getting a team of educators around the table, developing a common understanding around high quality teaching and learning. Um, looking for research-based practices around teaching and learning. And there is a lot of research around what those high yield strategies we want to see happen in the classroom, whether it's um, comparing, and comparing and contrasting the questioning techniques, um, making sure that, that we're observing those, making sure that um, we have a clear understanding of um, what student engagement looks like, what we want the classroom environment to look like. So when we walk into a classroom, you know, what do we want the teacher to be doing? What do we want to see the students, um, um, you know, what should they be doing in, in terms of when we walk in? Um, so for me, it's a lot of conversations around um, what does high quality teaching look like and sound like? What does the research show and state that we should be looking for? I also think one of the um, great things that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education did was create clear criteria around teaching and learning, um, looking at curriculum and instruction and assessment, teaching all, uh, all students. And they've um, come up with some really nice um, standards, um, indicators um, that really articulate what we hope to see. They've also um, developed some really nice what to look for guides um, around math, science, ELA um, that um, are really good work and um, good foundation to, to, to use. Um, so to me, it's a collaborative process. It's For me, it's um, engaging in the leadership team around what does good teaching look like, what do we want to observe. And then um, we actually in, um, are engaged in a process of, of conducting instructional rounds, which basically um, is a process to um, visit um, classrooms as leadership, a leadership team, not to observe what the teacher is doing, but to look for problems of practice, look for patterns and trends to inform improvement um, in school improvement, improvement in planning and looking for patterns. When I go into a classroom, 
um, you know, the first thing that I look at is the environment. Um, is this a place where I'd want to spend uh, um, time? Is you know, is it clean and organized? Is it, is the design and layout of the classroom purposeful? Um, is the flow of the classroom purposeful? Um, can I get quickly get a sense of what the purpose of of the learning um, that is happening? Um, can I quickly get an assessment of what that is? Is it posted? Is it um, is it evident? Um, what is the teacher doing? You know, um, is the teacher um, giving direct instruction? If the teacher is giving direct instruction, um, that's a very purposeful strategy. Can I can I then look at okay? I can see why the teacher has chosen this instruction strategy um, to deliver this content. Um, but most importantly, I look at what the students are being asked to do. Um, I think um, task predicts performance. I think when you look at what students are being asked to do, um, is it rigorous? Does it engage students in, in higher order thinking? Does it engage their critical thinking skills? Or is it just low level um, copying knowledge, just copying? Um, so I really think about and look at what the kid, kids are being asked to do. And lastly, um, you know, engage the students in conversations. You know, what are you working on? You know, can you explain, you know, the project you're working on or why you're doing this to get a sense of, of the classroom environment? But I also know that, um, you know, as a building principal being in classrooms um, a lot, that these are snapshots in time and that I collect my evidence around um, effective practice over time, that it's not just one visit, it's it's many visits, it's, it's um, hundreds of visits um, before you can really make a good assessment of whether effective practice is happening in a classroom. Thank you. We're approaching the end of our, uh, of our time. Is there anything that you would like to ask us or anything we w you wish we had asked you? No, I just um, want to take an opportunity to, to thank um, the school committee, uh, in the community for inviting me to participate in this process. Um, it's been a learning experience for me and I've um, appreciated the opportunity. Um, I think it affirms my, my visit on Monday and the conversations I've had with people that affirmed what I've, I know about Hockington. And I would say the highlight for me of the visit was going to the high school and recognizing the student faces. I couldn't recognize, I didn't remember all the names, but it was amazing to me to see the students and their faces and it was I, that was special for me so you know I went back and, I, and they were like oh what was the visit like and I said the best part of the visit was it was spending time with the school committee of course <laughs> naturally <laughs> yes but it was seeing the, the students that I had the opportunity to work with and get to know and um, you know as a teacher you, you your kids leave and you stay yeah. <laughs> and you don't always know what their story um, the end of their story so to me that was a highlight and it was great to see the kids and um, so I just want to thank everyone who's been involved everyone who's been very professional and, and kind to me and respectful of me and, and that's greatly appreciated and I wish the community the best of luck thank you I understand that the anxiousness that a community can feel when you have a great leader and you're replacing that person and um, you want to make sure you find the right fit. And if I am the right fit, it would be an honor and privilege to, to serve the community of Hopkinton, and I would do whatever I could to earn the trust and respect of the community. So. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, Craig. And I'll see you tomorrow. Yes, Some Mina and I. That's right, yes. yes. We'll be back. Uh-oh, where am I supposed to be? <laughs> <laughs>